Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BNH Virtual Event Space. Today, we are going to help you improve your nature photography. Got a couple tips, and uh, these don't involve what you think they would normally involve. Always thinking outside the box, Russell Graves. Welcome back. Tr trying to think outside the box. Always. Uh, yeah, you, you know, so much of what, we, well, by the way, uh, I hope you're not freezing to death up there in New York City. I know it's been plenty cold here in, in Texas, uh, uncomfortably cold, single digit cold here where I live. And so my presentation, I included spring colors to at least help us think outside the box and think towards more more perfect weather as spring comes along, Derek. Did that I love you? it. I love Because we are freezing up here, Russ. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you uh, get to what you do best. Huge thank you to you for coming back on the platform as yeah. always. And uh, remind all of our viewers out there, if you guys do have any questions, feel free to drop them into the comment section if you're joining us from Vimeo or YouTube. If you didn't know we had a YouTube, well, now you know. Head over to YouTube. It is at BH Event Space on there. You look up the BH Event Space right in the search T tab on YouTube. And uh, look, I'm going to get out of the way, Russ. I'll see you in a bit for some Q&A. Sounds good. Hey, make sure before you go, you can see my screen, right? Yes, sir. It looks okay. good. Okay, perfect. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to a new year. It feels like it's been about uh, three months since I've been here, but it's been, uh, I guess, about a month. I think I was told I did the the last B&H webinar of 2023, and that was seems like a, a, a million years ago, way back before Christmas back in 2023 and uh now we're in a new year and it's a, a new time and i'm already thinking forward you know one of the things that as uh as we were talking about topics for this this uh webinar you know i i concede and i think everyone listening will concede that you know so much of what we do with photography doesn't involve our camera and it doesn't involve actually picking up a camera you know there's a lot of just to understand how to use a camera there's a lot of study work and there's a lot of prep and there's just a lot of time you take understanding uh, just how to use the camera. And so today, as I was thinking about that, and, and, and it's when we have weather like this, this is when I start thinking about things like that. And this is when I take, if the weather's too inclement, like it was a little cold this weekend for us and, and kind of snowy and rainy. And I just didn't want to get, get outside. And so during that time is when I try to take advantage of the time to be outside and uh, or be inside and work on those things to improve my nature photography ga game that doesn't necessarily involve a camera. I'm almost ashamed to say that I haven't picked up my camera in uh, two or three weeks. And so I've been kind of working on some of these things, but that's typical. And I'll talk about some of these things here in a minute. Uh, again, welcome. My name is Russell Graves. I'm coming to you live from Hackberry Farm, Dodge City, Texas. Uh, it's a beautiful day out today. We're, we're actually getting a little bit past the cold weather. We've got highs slated to be in the in the 40s today before it gets a little bit colder this weekend but i think the temperatures are soon to moderate back to normal levels which for us in this part of texas is usually lows in the upper 20s and, and highs in the in the upper 40s or low 50s so and when the weather's like that it's just perfect so like uh, derek said it, i want this to be as much of a, a dialogue as we can and so as i go through this if you have any questions uh feel free to pop them in the chat there i'd be happy to answer them and in the end, here's what I want you to be thinking about. I, I want to know what, what your thing is and what do you do to, to improve your nature photography game when you're not, when you're not, that doesn't involve a camera. So be thinking about that for me. I'll give you my contact information at the end. Feel free to reach out because I always like to hear everyone else's input. So with that said, let's go get started. And a lot of these things are going to sound kind of esoteric, but again, we're not talking about photography in general. We're kind of limiting all this to that nature photography genre. And, and I think one of the most important things you can do is learn plant identification. That's one of those things that you can sit by the fire uh, with a book or looking on the internet and, and then, and then start the basics of learning plant identification. Because one of the, one of the key things that I coach people about all the time is if you use uh if you think about nature photography you know we all like seeing you know if you travel much you like going to alaska and seeing the bears or going uh you know out to yellowstone and seeing the bison but all of those animals are are part of a food web and that food web gets supported at various layers and at various parts by different things well almost the whole food web or, or food chain if you remember the old food chain model that used to be used it all starts in the soil and from the soil plants emerge. And so plants provide an important role in the ecology. 
And, uh, you know, I didn't really get that at first when I started becoming a nature photography. And I've been doing this for a long time. I am 54 now. I started taking pictures when I was 16 years old. I grew up where I live now on my farm. It's about a mile from where I grew up. And uh, I spent all of my youth roaming these hills and, and learning about nature and learning to l- appreciate nature. And so when I started taking pictures with film back in the 80s, uh, that was the thing I, I really focused on the most was the things that I was most familiar with. And uh, that was all the wildlife and the nature that was around me and the rural lifestyle that was around me. Well, one of the things I never took the time to appreciate are all those plants that you can see on a given basis. And so as a photographer, learning plant identification helps you become a better naturalist, number one. And number two, it gives you something else to take a picture of, because if you appreciate something, you know, like your like your kids or your grandkids and, and you 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 show your love and appreciation by taking nice pictures of them. When you appreciate something, you'll take pictures of it. And by learning plant identification, uh, it just gave me something else to photograph. And we all know because the more you photograph whatever you're taking a picture of, the better you're going to get it, not only photographing that that particular subject. But you're going to get better at photographing uh, in general so, because there's, there's, there's no better way to get better at taking pictures than just to take pictures and, and practice, practice, practice. So things like shutter speed, aperture, ISO settings, all of that stuff becomes second nature to you where you don't really have to think about it. And so by learning plan identification, again, you become a better naturalist. And then number two, it gives you, a, it gives you something else in which to take pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. I've had a little bit of a cold this past week, so apologize for the cough. Uh, anyway, so how do you, what are a couple of ways you can go about learning plan ID? And, uh, you know, I, I've got a number of books around here because I'm kind of old school. I still like holding things in my hands and I like books. But one of the things that I found really valuable, especially when I'm, I'm kind of in a remote area, are their apps. And the one I, I like using is called Seek. And Seek is an app that uh, will geolocate where you are and it'll give you, once you show it a picture of something, it'll give you a most likely, it'll give you the most likely uh, option of what that plan is. Now, one of the things I do, and I know I don't, you know, I don't, since I live in the country, one of the things I like to do on a regular basis, especially in the spring and summer when everything starts to green back up, is I've been keeping a running inventory of all the, the different plant species that I find on my property. And every time I find one, I try to take a, a nice identifying picture of that species, not only to give me an exercise to do, but also for perpetuity sake. And, you know, and if you're, if you're, if you're here listening to this webinar, you're a lifelong learner anyway. And so as part of, in the, in the spirit of being a lifelong learner, uh, I, I try to keep an inventory of all the plants on my particular property. And, I'm amazed at two things. Number one, I'm amazed the fact that I found about 230 different plant species on my own property. Number one. Number two, I'm amazed I keep finding new ones that I'd never seen before. So every time there's a variation in rainfall or temperature patterns or whatever, there's something in the seed bank that may come up one year that doesn't come up the next year. And so it just gives me something else to discover, something else to learn. And by learning plant ID, again, I've, I've grown to have a deeper appreciation for nature. It's made me a better nature photographer and it gives me an excuse to get out and use my camera a whole lot more. Again, if you've got any questions, just pop them in there and go through. Oh, let me go back one more time. I forgot to m- mention one thing on this. So the ways and another bonus on, of seek a way to use it that a lot of people don't think about, even though it's a great tool in the field. Uh, a lot of times what I'll do, if I don't have a good signal where I can't, where it can't access this database to tell me what plan I'm looking at, a lot of times, if you'll take a good picture of something, and when you get it back into your computer at home, you can you can actually show the Seek app a picture, and it doesn't know if it's a live plant or if it's a picture, and you can identify it because you can always change. Even though you're 500 miles away, when you get back, you can change the location you're at. You Seek, and it'll help identify. And so when I'm going through later on and cataloging my pictures, if I can't remember what something is, I'll use that Seek app to help me identify it, and it's in it. It's an indispensable uh, tool to use. And by the way, I, I have no affiliation with Seek other than like I like to recommend a good product when I see it. And that's a pretty good product to use. The second thing I, I recommend you do, and there's so many good tools to do it now, is start a journal. Now, full disclosure, I'm not nearly as good 
at keeping my journals what I should be. There's times when I'll really write a lot in my journal. There's other times when I don't write so much in my journal. But when you think about starting a journal, you, you've already got you've got already a lot of the uh, a lot of the activity whipped in the first place. Because if you're out taking pictures of something, you've already got a if as long as you keep your camera the date and time set you've kind of got a chronology of where you've been and what you were doing at that particular time in your life. And so what I recommend to people is, is, uh, is start writing about your experiences in the field. You know, what did you see? how did it make you feel? What did you, uh, what, what did you think about what you saw? Did you, did something surprise you? Did it not surprise you? And, and just take time to internalize and think about all the things you've seen before. You know, it's, uh, when I was in high school, I used to curse my my English teacher because she'd make us journal. But looking back, I kind of understand why she did it because it kind of makes you think, kind of makes you come up with your own prompts. And now in the digital age, there's there may not be a better way to start a journal. I mean, that journal can even be a video journal if you wanted to. If you don't want to write, it'd be easy to sit down and use your phone or use a GoPro or your or your mirrorless or digital SLR camera. They all do video now is to record yourself talking about your experiences and what you saw and what you photographed on any particular day uh it, it and also the new uh i've noticed the, the the new update that came out i don't know a month or so ago on the iphone now has a journaling app built into it and every single day it'll give you a prompt about you know write about this or write about this picture you just took or write about something else you experienced today and it's a great way to uh keep up with your thoughts it's a great way to uh organize your thoughts. It's, and it's a great way to go back and relive later on. I mean, I think it's kind of neat to go back in my twenties when I wrote some journal entries and read about what I was thinking about then. And I think for, for, for any other reason, other than just your own personal edification, excuse me for just one second. It's that cold. I got to get a little liquid in me, even though it may be for your own personal edification or uh, just to kind of leave a legacy behind your, your kids and your grandkids will thank you because I, I, how many times I think about my granddad, he died when he was, I think, 93. No, 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 no. My granddad died at 88 back in 1993. And uh, I've often wondered, he was born in 1905, and I've often wondered what was life like, you know, in the 30s during the Great Depression and during that era nearly 100 years ago. And it would have been neat if he had written a journal to kind of tell what his life was like back then, just to have that connection to the past, that real connection to the past with someone you knew, because we can all, you know, you can go to any library or online and read journals of a uh, Hugh Glass or, or, or uh, some of the more famous Western frontiersmen like Lewis and Clark and all, all, all the explorers that, that kept journals, which are, which are cool in their own right, really neat in their own right. But how much neater would it be if you had a personal connection? So for any other reason, I think start a journal and, and share with your closest, share with yourself and then the closest ones around you about what, what life and what nature is like while you're experiencing it, when you experienced it. And number three, and this is, this is something you can do uh, that will increase, that will, is bound to help better you as a nature photographer and it will increase your love for nature and it's going to help out the planet just a little bit. And that's plant a wildflower garden. Now, again, it's easy for me to say because I've, I live on acreage and I've got plenty of uh, room to do it, but I've got a wildflower garden that's about, I don't know, probably 6,000 square feet that's in front of my house. And I bought locally adapted plants, and that's a key thing. I always I believe in using uh, native seeds. And so I found a source online where I could buy native seeds for the wildflowers that thrive in this area, and I planted them. And uh, in doing so, number one, if the very least I get to look at pretty flowers in front of my house every year, then it's a win. Number two, uh, those flowers are going to increase a bunch of subjects for me. I've almost single-handedly learned macro photography on my own because of that wildflower garden I planted just right in front of my house. I mean, literally, if I got up from my, my office chair now, it's about a hundred foot walk to the edge of the garden out front. And so when spring comes and the flowers start growing and it attracts hummingbirds and bees and all kinds of insects and even the petals themselves all of a sudden it becomes a, 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 a something you can take pictures of now i've got the land and space to be able to do it but what if you live in more confined spaces well number one 
a lot of these plants are easy to be that you can grow in container. Let's say you live on a in a uh, in a uh, a subdivision or not a subdivision in a condo somewhere, and you have limited space. Well, a lot of these can be grown in containers out on the stoop somewhere, and then uh, also if you don't have any of that available, excuse me, then uh, you've also got the option of just participating in a community garden or even finding a botanical garden that's nearby your house that you can, you can, uh, uh, you know, financially support them in some way or, or, or in kind support in some way, but plant a wildflower garden. And uh, it's amazing at the different, at the different benefits that come from that this year. And this is what I, this is so unusual to me or this past year, this is what's so, so unusual to me. And I mentioned it in number one about learn plant ID we're starting to see now flowers come up in our wildflower garden that that according to the label of the seeds we bought to plant weren't even in the seeds that we initially planted and the reason and the reason what I, I think what is happening is because the bees and the birds and everything else is interacting with that wildflower garden i think they're starting to bring seeds in and then on their own in a natural way kind of uh increase the plant diversity within that space and then uh as time goes on and and every wildflower has kind of a different or a lot of wildflowers have a different calendar or a different season in which they unfold there's some wildflowers i think that may sit out there for years before it gets the right amount of rain and then that then the, then the, all of a sudden they'll they've got the perfect conditions to germinate and they go ahead and germinate This is the fourth one. And so I grew up, when I grew up, I always knew about federal duck stamps because they've been around forever. But it surprises me when you talk about to photographers, especially people like we'll go out to Bosque del Apache in New Mexico. If you've never heard of that, it's a it's kind of a famous place in New Mexico. It's a wildlife refuge out there that uh, that has tens of thousands of uh, sandhill cranes and snow geese that migrate in and out of that every year and not just snow geese but all kinds of other animals live out there mountain lions and they're not you don't see them as commonly but mountain lions and elk and mule deer and javelinas and all kinds of stuff use that that federal wildlife refuge uh as home and so one of the ways is so you got to think about how these things are set up regular you know from a fit from a, a governmental standpoint the wildlife refuge system in the United States as part of the uh, as part of the, the Fish and Wildlife Service. The National Park System is part of the National Park Service. And so there's even though they're all federal land, they're supported financially in different ways. When you go to Yosemite National Park, <coughs> excuse me, or you go to uh, one of the other big national parks and you pay your entrance fee, that's a big way those national parks are supported. When you go to a wildlife refuge, a lot of times, which Bosque del Apache is not one of those, but a lot of times they don't have a fee to get in. And so one of the big ways that their mission gets supported is through federal duck, duck stamps. Now, duck stamps is one of the requisites you have to have if you want to hunt ducks. You, the fed, the uh, All state agencies require you to go and buy a federal duck stamp in order if you're going to hunt ducks. And so by buying a federal duck stamp, depending on what you think of hunting, you're supported in supporting hunting. It's going to support those wildlife refuges with those ducks use as they migrate south for the winter, then go back north to nest every year. And so that's one of the things you can do if you love if you photograph in, in national wildlife refuges, and you and you love the animals that hang out there. The federal duck stamp you buy goes to help support those things. And so where do you buy one from? You can buy one from nearly just about any retailer that sells hunting license, like here locally, you can go to Walmart and, uh, and buy a federal duck stamp. But most commonly, you can just walk into a post office and buy a federal duck stamp if you get to the post office much, or like everything else, you can buy them online too. They're about 25 bucks a year, I think. They may have went up a little bit more than that, but they're around $25 a year. But again, you buy one, you support it. It's got a really cool piece of artwork on it. Some people collect them and have been collecting them for years, so it's a collectible item as well because each year that art on that duck stamp, it's a, it's a brand new piece of art that they put on there. <clears throat> and 
and it's a uh, crowdsource. The the art on the on the uh, on the duck stamp is crowdsourced. Every year they have a competition to for whose painting gets put on the duck stamp, and so you're also helping to support uh, independent artists whenever you you buy a duck stamp as well. So it's a it's a great great program that I recommend just about everyone participating in. And then this is a big one too: join a conservation organization. I think we all know instinctively that, uh, you know, there's only so much that we can do individually, you know, again, depending on your circumstance, you know, where you live, you know, if you live in a subdivision somewhere, there's only so much you can do from a conservation standpoint. Uh, you know, if you live on acreage like I, I live on, you can do a little more, you know, individually, but, but a lot of times it's hard to do something individually. You don't know where to start. And then, so what I recommend is join a conservation organization. There's all kinds of them. And, and one thing I encourage people to do is find one that kind of aligns with your, uh, with, with your sensibilities. You know, there's some conservation organizations like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. They do a lot of work to conserve land and habitat wherever elk are found, not necessarily out West, but also uh, in some of the Eastern states, you know, I think it's Pennsylvania has one of the largest uh, populations of wild elk uh, east, or has the largest population of wild elk east of the Mississippi River. But there's a lot of states, Virginia, or not West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina. There's a lot of states where where the elk run wild once again. They were, they, elk were found across the continent, uh, you know, in the early 1800s, but then as then as people started moving west and clearing forest and hunting, uh, or not hunting, it's not regulated hunting, but 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 killing uh, animals for the marketplace or killing wildlife for mar the marketplace or killing animals for their own sustenance, the elk were extirpated from the eastern half of the United States. Well, organizations like the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, uh, they helped turn that all back around and are helping reintroduce elk where elk were once found before now i say that the good work they do but a lot of people not may not their values may not align with the rocky mountain elk foundation because the rocky mountain elk foundation is a pro hunting organization and so but there's a lot of or conservation organizations that do good work that aren't necessarily pro hunting so i encourage you to uh to find a group that aligns with what your values are and then help support them. The Nature Conservancy is a good one. I mean, they uh, they uh, they conserve a lot of critical habitat, and really, especially in Texas, unusual land that's not uh, unusual land that's that's that there's you won't find a lot of. Let me give you an example of that, so I can better articulate it. Uh, I know here close to where I live, well, Texas, by the way is 98% privately owned. So there's not a lot of public land in Texas. And the Nature Conservancy properties aren't aren't overtly public land, but you can get access to them. Uh, but here where I live, just maybe 45 minutes south, there's a big uh, tall grass prairie that the Nature Conservancy owns and manages. And uh, it's one of the very few pieces of native tall grass prairie that's never been plowed that's left in the state. You know, some of the tall grass prairies are coming back, but they've been they've been re sown by people who care about the land and care about the prairies. But that's one of the few pieces left that have never been touched by a plow. And it's the way it has been for centuries. They've also got another property that's about an hour east of where I live. That's uh, that's home to some of the oldest southern pine forests left in Texas. I mean, you go down there. Most of, most of the pine trees you see will be a couple of feet across that you see growing now because a lot of the old trees were cut down and these are new growth. But you'll go into that property and I've been before, you'll see these big southern yellow pines that are that are three and four feet across, just enormous trees, old, old trees. And that's the kind of thing the Nature Conservancy does. Audubon Society is another good one that, uh, you know, looks out for birds. I, I use a lot of the Audubon Society references for what I do just to learn about birds, learn about migration to help make me a better naturalist. But individually, you may not feel like you can do much, but if you pay these, these uh, membership fees to these, which are nominal 30, 40 bucks a year or whatever they are to these different conservation organizations, they help leverage your money to be able to do a lot of bigger things. And the one thing it does do is it opens you up to a network 
of like-minded individuals where that's always a good thing because a lot of the places I've got a chance to photograph is not because I discovered these places on my own, but because of the network I'm able to build and the people I get to know through organizations like this. And then you just, you're, you're able to get access to some properties and to uh, some nature photography opportunities that you may not have been able to access before. So join a conservation organization, buy a duck stamp. They're both good ways to support conservation. And again, in the app, you're doing something good for the planet. You're doing something good for nature and wildlife. You're doing something good for yourself and your community. And plus, as a, as, as a, uh, if you're being a little bit selfish, it may open up some opportunities for you to find some other cool places in which to photograph. And along those same lines, volunteer to do a little conservation work. So if you become a member of one of these organizations, and a lot of these organizations have local chapters, they're not, they're not, all, they're not all organized on a national level, a lot of these organizations have local chapters and local chapters are full of people you may know or they're full of your neighbors or at least people live nearby. Uh, and a lot of times they'll have these conservation uh, work days where you can go out in the field, get to meet wildlife professionals, get to meet botanists, get to meet naturalists and other professionals, and then do a little work. I know, uh, in this county where I live, probably about 10 or 15 miles northeast of here, there's a, a national grasslands. It's a federally managed property, and it's about 24,000 acres. And I know from time to time, conservation organizations would go out there and do trail clearing work, or they'd help with prescribed burns. And the picture you're seeing here was actually some uh, work I did with the conservation organization out, in, out in, a, in a different part of the state where we were doing a prescribed burn on a piece of prairie. And so that's one of the pictures I took there. And again, the, uh, when you volunteer and you get to meet people and, and get to hang out with like-minded people, it just helps you start thinking about the resource a little better starts. And then when you start thinking about becoming a, uh, uh, about how to capture those local stories about a place or wildlife or, or, or bugs or anything in nature, when you start thinking about how to capture those, all of a sudden that part of your brain or at least does it does for me that part of your brain turns on where uh, all of a sudden you start figuring out how to solve these photographic problems. And so all these things, you know, this whole presentation today, I, I feel like I'm, I'm a, uh, I can't overemphasize it enough. It's, it's all these, these tactics I'm talking to you about today are all those things that just have to do with, with the, the mental part of photography, the thought process of it, <clears throat> and not necessarily the nuts and bolts of photography, and so you've got photography, you got how to use lenses, how to use ISO, composition, all those nuts and bolts things. Well, all these things I'm talking about today are those soft skills that kind of fit in between the gaps. And all those soft skills that fit in between the gaps are what's going to help you uh, increase your access, give you a better appreciation of, of the resource, and uh, help, you, help you find uh, better places in which to photograph. And more places in which to photograph. I, I can tell you this. There was a time uh, when I was in my 20s, I had virtually, I was like a lot of people, the only places I had to go photograph, it said some family land I could go on. But other than that, it was uh, it was public land. It was state parks or, you know, the national grasslands or national forests, places like that, which aren't always the best places to go. And so by doing some of these things we're talking about by joining, you know, I was a, a member of Quell of a Quell Unlimited for a time and by volunteering to do conservation work and just help out, help out wildlife professionals that I met, my network began to grow. And so there, I, I would say at time is probably still today, but there was a time I counted probably 10 or 15 years ago. And I, I and this number hasn't changed at all. It maybe has increased. There was a time I went, so just having a handful of places I could go to now, I bet I've got access to over a million acres of private land that all I've got to do is pick up the phone and ask the question and get permission. And I could go out there and do it. But, but one of the, one of the cool things about it is if you involve yourself in this network of people and you're, and you're, you know, you're kind to them and you're helping out and you're showing an earnest effort to conserve and make the world a better place and make the world a better place for the wildlife and, and the people like us who appreciate it and the nature and the people like us who appreciate it, uh, the doors start opening for you. I can't tell you how many times, uh, well, the, 
I, I'll tell you one time in particular, I don't know if these pictures are in this presentation. I can't remember or not, but uh, I got a phone call from a rancher down the road and he had heard that uh, I was a photographer. This is probably 15, 20 years ago, something like that. And he says, uh, I've got a couple of baby bobcats hanging out in my backyard. Well, when you think of it in Texas terms, if you're a rancher, a backyard is not a proper backyard like you may have a subdivision. It's just the pasture in the back. And so a lot of times I would kind of, I would sort of take advice like that with a grain of salt. Because I'd think, are you seeing a bobcat or are you seeing just a stray cat? You know, so, you know, I said, okay, I'll be out there. So I wasn't doing anything else. Grabbed my camera, drove about 10 miles away to this guy's place. And sure enough, he had two, when I say baby, they're this big blue eyed bobcats wrestling around in, in his uh, back pasture. And it was such a cool thing to watch and such a uh, cool thing to photograph. And I just, I love telling that story and I love telling those pictures. <clears throat> I love looking at those pictures and I, I love telling the story because it underscores once you start building that network, how many opportunities open for you. You know, we've all heard the saying, the harder I work, the luckier I get. When you start doing volunteer conservation work and working to build your network, um, the luckier you get as a nature photographer and the, just the more opportunities open up for you. Number seven, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but one of the things that I try to tell people to do is uh, try to keep a creative edge. And usually I, I mentioned earlier that I hadn't picked up my camera in a while and that's, that's a little bit of planned uh, activity that I usually have this time of year, every year. I, I, I'll, I'm usually pretty busy with photography in the fall and, uh, and up until Christmas time. And then once the, once Christmas is over and the new year's begins, I kind of step away from it for a while and just take a break from it. Uh, not that I'm, I, I'm, you know, if, if Bigfoot or UFO were to land outside, I'll certainly be ready for it, but I don't really go out seeking a lot of opportunities during this time of year. And, and really, it's for, it's for a number of reasons. Number one, one of those reasons is uh, because it, it's from a business standpoint, since I make my living as a photographer, from a business standpoint, it kind of gives me a chance to reset and get caught up on a few business things because I kind of, I think about my, you know, my, my physical year starts January 1st. And so I, I start thinking about the year's work from a January 1st time frame. So it gives me a little time to catch up on, on the busy work that I need to catch up on. Uh, it gives me a chance to kind of think about what I want to be doing and how I need to accomplish that. And then uh, no, it just, number two, it gives me a break because like anything else, you know, be careful what you wish for. When I was younger, I always wished to be a professional photographer. And I looked up one day and my, and my wish came true. And so I get to do it a lot, but it, it does become work as crazy as that sounds uh being gone and meeting deadlines and doing all the things you've got to do to kind of run a, a small independent business it becomes work and so it gives me a chance to stay away from that but the but the thing it does from a photography standpoint i think is is really 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 valuable is it gives you a chance to just kind of step away from the camera for a little bit and not necessarily actively think about how you can do things differently but just give you a break from it for just a little bit. So that way, when you go back to photography, if I find where I start seeing things with, with brand new eyes, uh, when I was shooting a lot of commercial work, I noticed I did this a lot. It almost became like, I, it felt like I was shooting the same picture over and over and over again. I don't know how many people can relate to this analogy. I give a lot, but uh, in the old, when I was a kid, I used to watch the Flintstones a lot. And then the old Flintstones and Fred and Barney, would be in the car going somewhere the background would repeat over and over and over and over again so it's just the same background well with commercial photography i got where it, it felt like i was doing that i would get hired by a company to go shoot you know their new clothes or their new uh gear for this campaign and i was taking the same you know different different products different people different gear but i was kind of taking the same picture over or it felt like i was saying taking the same picture over and over and over again so i learned a long time ago to to keep a creative edge sometimes it's best just to set the camera down and not even think about the the act of photography and just look to other sources for inspiration and so how do i do that and i say magazines that's not an antiquated slide i still look at a lot of magazines i prefer uh you know i was at a trade show the other day and picked up this uh this this booklet from the 
the uh, uh, conservation organization. And the reason why I like holding stuff in my hands and I like looking at it. I'd mentioned that, I think on my last webinar, or maybe, maybe it wasn't on my last webinar. It was recently I mentioned to somebody that I pick up a lot of books and I look at a lot of magazines that you can hold in your hand. And the reason why, at least for me and the way my brain works, they don't have any links you can click on. And so when you've got something like this and you're immersed in something like that, you're immersed in only that. There's no, there's no rabbit holes that you get drawn down where you started looking at the campaign for Quell and their material, but you ended up watching some conspiracy theory about, uh, about Bigfoots in, uh, in, in East Texas. And so because of that, I like looking at a lot of magazines. And when I look at them, it gives me a chance to kind of focus on pictures that other people have, have done and what's sort of making that industry go around. And when I say look at magazines, I mean, look at a lot of different kind of magazines. Uh, I'm going to lose a lot of credibility here, Derek, I'm afraid. But one of my one of my favorite magazines I love looking at, it's a uh, it's a lifestyles magazine called Country Living. It has nothing to do with nature photography. It's got a lot to do with home decor and cooking. But I like looking at it because they do a wonderful job in the photography of that magazine. Now, I doubt if I'll ever do any work for that magazine, but I can still appreciate it's like good music. I, it, even though I don't necessarily uh, listen to classical music at all, when you hear a piece and you see it, hear how complicated it is and the musicianship it takes to go into that, you can still appreciate it for what it is. And that's what I do when I look at a lot of magazines and books to keep my creative edge. And I still collect books. Every time I go somewhere to a new town, I'll try to see if they've got a little local bookstore and I'll try to buy a book from that area. And so I've got a I've got a, a pretty big library of books I've collected over years and I'll still pick them up for old inspiration and look them, look at them again uh, for inspiration. And then, like I said, I just study other people's work. I'm not very, you can do that on Instagram and, and Facebook and some of the social media platforms. I, I don't really like doing that. I spend enough time looking at screens every day. And so I like to, I like looking at analog work a lot. Again, that's kind of, you know, I, I get. I suppose I'm kind of like the guy who uses a, a old fashioned typewriter when I think about writing stuff. But you know, I, I do. I spend a lot of time looking at or staring at a screen every day. And so the last thing I like doing is picking up my phone and looking at stuff. So when I study other people's work, again, it's through some some sort of analog mean. It's a books or a magazine or some other way. But it doesn't mean I won't necessarily look at Instagram from time to time. I just prefer to kind of look at things old school way because again. It take when you're looking at something like that, you're kind of engrossed in that page, and it takes an act to go to the next page. It's not as easy as just swapping. And I say that, and it sounds so, so logical, and you're probably thinking, "Duh," but it, but it's true. When you take something that when you put something in your hands, or at least I've found that's click proof and that it's scroll proof, I find myself being a lot more immersed in that piece of work that's in front of me right now, and so. Uh, that, that's how I, I, I work every year to kind of maintain a creative edge. And I mentioned this before, just set the camera down a while. It's kind of like uh, I've been married for 30 years now and I love my wife every single day. But, you know, if you've ever been away from from your significant other it, for any length of time, you know, you, you kind of get into this groove when you see each other every day and you know you're going to see them later on. And then all of a sudden you're gone from each other for a couple of weeks and sort of when you see each other again, you've got that little tingle again like you like you felt when you first met them and so that's not in the same way but a similar kind of way i don't i don't my wife's not in here right now she'd be questioning how i'm phrasing this and so in a similar kind of way that's how i am with the camera you know I, i'll set it down for a while and uh and when i go back to it it's like it's hey hello old friend it's like you're you're learning it all over again and you're and, and it makes me kind of fall in love with what i love about the medium in the first place and 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 the medium of just taking pictures and capturing natural scenes and kind of a dynamic and in a meaningful way, at least for me. And then lesson number eight is uh, learn the life history of your favorite animals. One of the, the and this actually led to a, a good thing for me, and I don't mean to say this as a, uh, as a commercial for Russell, but one of the things I learned early on as a photographer, because and I still, I still have a tendency to do this. I would, I would go out and I'd be like, I just want to take a picture of everything. 
Well, at some point, I started learning, slow down and just pick something. And so I started learning, if you just pick one animal or one plant or one, one you know, macro photography or, or one patch of garden that you planted, wildflower garden, and just learn all you can about that, all of a sudden you start kind of disciplining yourself to take sort of a, a step-by-step sort of systems approach to being able to tell a story on that stuff. It, it's not, it, it's, you're just not going out manically taking pictures of everything you see. You're slowing yourself down and you're thinking yourself through the process. And that act of thinking myself through the process made me a better photographer than just kind of just point and shoot and the spray and pray mentality and hope you get something. And so one of the first animals I ever did that on was when I when I graduated college in 93, I moved from Northeast Texas out to Northwest Texas. Well, out, it's about 250 miles from here. Well, out that way in Texas, every 30 miles you go west, the, the amount of precipitation you get drops off pretty dramatically over time. And so where I, where I moved to out of college, got about half as much of rain a year as what I did here. And where I do, where I live now, we've got a lot more trees and a lot more tall grasses. Well, out there, it's more scrub country, kind of semi-arid, uh, open rangelands, short grass prairie area. It's the haunt of the buffalo. If, if anyone watched the uh, Ken Burns documentary about the uh, about the American buffalo that came on a month or so ago, and in that story, he talks a lot about Quanta Parker. And that whole area that Quanta Parker and the Quahati band of the Comanches, the area in which they used to roam was the area I lived in for 26 years. And so in my 20s, I found this one critter that I'd never, I'd heard about them, but I'd never seen one before, much less ever took a picture of them. And that was the, the black-tailed prairie dog. And as, as uh, benign of an animal that sounds for some reason, I'd always like squirrels and rodents, but for some reason, those prairie dogs and the way they live captured my imagination. And so as serendipity would have it, and by building those relationships I talked about before, a mile, I used to teach high school and a mile north of the high school from where I taught on private land was a prairie dog town. And the guy that owned the property still gives me access to the property today. The guy that owned the property said, anytime you want to go out there and take pictures of those prairie dogs, you're more than welcome to. Well, I started taking pictures of prairie dogs and fell in love with them. And the more I learned about them, the more I wanted to take pictures of them. And so I started taking pictures of everything that, that prairie dogs would do, try, trying to tell their life story. And after about a year, I looked at my body of work. And by, by the way, this was still shooting on slides. And I looked at my body of work and I realized I may have, and I'm, I'm a 27 year old having this realization I may have one of the best collection of prairie dog images that anyone in the country has. And so it gave me an idea and the young entrepreneur in me, even though I was a teacher, I was still had the entrepreneurial bent. And so I started pitching it to book publishers and I found a publisher willing to publish a, a book. And it was my the second book I'd ever written, my first coffee table book. Uh, and it was called Prairie Dog Sentinel of the Plains. And that book was all about prairie dogs, all about their life history of it. And I wrote the book as well. And uh, it's a, I wish I had one handy. I'd, I'd brag on myself and show it to you. But I was 29 years old when that thing was published. And that I tell people all the time, jokingly, that's the best dog I ever had. Because that one book paid for my kids to go to college. It was so, did so well for me back then. And it all started because Russell told himself, you got to slow down and pick one thing to take a picture of. And so early on, I learned the life history of my favorite animal. And because I spent a, a good amount of time studying that animal, I kind of became somewhat of an expert. I couldn't defend a PhD dissertation and have a have a doctorate in prairie dogs. But from a layperson standpoint, I kind of I know a lot about prairie dogs and still do and and even did back then. And because I learned a lot about the animal, I became fascinated with the animal. I wanted to take more pictures of it. It led to me networking and meeting more people and giving me more access. And then it had a financial payoff in the, in the end for me. Now, I'm not saying that you should always look for a financial payoff in the end, but that, that's, a, that's one of the best analogies I can think of is how learning the life history of an, of an animal can lead to something greater and bigger. And so what would be awesome to see is if uh, anyone listening takes my advice on this part of it 
and, and you start following that same sort of path that I did, I'd love to hear where you end up at on all these things. And so I think it'd be incredible. And this is a big one too. I didn't know about this book uh, for a while, but there's a, there's a, uh, a naturalist. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm going to go back one more. Oop. On the learn the life history of your favorite animal. Uh, in case you're wondering, that book is it's it's out of print now, but I think you can still find there's still a few new copies kind of floating around, and you can still find a few used copies uh, on like Amazon, but uh, uh, and you can buy them really cheap, and I, you know I don't make any money off that because my royalties already already been made off of it a long time ago. But if if you're if you're interested in that, go take a look at that. It's a it was just a cool cool project to work on, and it's one of those things that I, I'm still really really proud of. And it's it's the second of seven books I've ever done, but it's it's still the one that that I think really followed this logic of learning everything I can about an animal, and uh, and just really trying to be an expert on that one animal. Back to this one. Read the book of Sand County Almanac. There's a uh, there's a naturalist in Wisconsin. Back in the 30s and 40s, uh, named Aldo Leopold, he wrote a book. It was kind of a memoir called A Sand County Almanac. And that Sand County Almanac, it's still quoted today as kind of one of those seminal pieces of literature that defines the modern conservation movement in America. And what it talks about, one of the things I think the world family talks about, it says that the five, five things that were used to destroy wildlife populations can be the same five things that can be used to restore them or, or natural populations. And those five things, and I'm probably going to forget one here because I've been talking a lot, is the axe. And what they mean by axe is how it's used to destroy is cutting down forest uh, and deforestation, the plow. And what he meant by that was, you know, once deforestation came in the east, we plowed up all the plains and created ecological disasters like the Dust Bowl. The axe, plow, cow, and then in Western uh, regions, the cow was used to overgrade and degrade uh, streamside areas and rivers and everything else. The axe, plow, cow, gun, over harvest of animals, destroyed their population. And then fire, what was traditionally used as a way to, uh, uh, to rid the country of undesirable plants. Uh, well, the fire historically was used as a negative thing to uh, rid areas and just, you know, the whole slash and burn thing. And so he says in that book, and he, and he explains it beautifully, that the five things, axe, cow, plow, gun, and fire, the five things that were used to, to destroy wildlife and natural populations historically are the same five things that can be used to, to restore them. And so if you take the time to go back and do some other things we talked about, like volunteering for a conservation organization, you'll see that a lot of those same tools that are, and I use them on my property right now. Uh, I went out and, and burned, selectively burned various places because I know when I burn those, there's invasive plants there. Now I beat back the invasive plants to give the native plants a chance to come back. So I use fire and use all those same tools to manage lands right now. And it increases uh, your biodiversity in a particular property. And so uh, you can buy that book online all the time. You can get it from your local library. It's really a good read, especially if you're, if you're really uh, interested in kind of hearing someone's perspective on the natural world and, and sort of a, a, just a deep rooted view and kind of a historic, a little bit of a history lesson on how we got to where we are today and how the, the, the North, the North American model of wildlife conservation, which by the way, started way back in the early 20th century when, you know, Teddy Roosevelt started developing the national park system and the national wildlife system and setting aside all these grounds for the collective use of people. This is kind of the science and the, in the academics and the thought behind all that. And so if you, if you have a cold winter's day and you want to learn more about nature and natural ecology, a Sand County Almanac is a, is a hard book to, to be. And again, what amazes me about it is how relevant the, uh, the things that Aldo Leopold talks about in that book, how relevant they are today here in, uh, gosh, 2024. It's hard to believe it's that late. And so the last thing I would ask, and maybe that's a good time to transition to the question is, uh, I'd like to know what other people's things are. If you want to take time to, uh, 
to because I could this thing this this whole thing started out as six ways to be a better nature photographer that don't involve your camera it grew into nine ways and I could probably put another twenty ways in here but uh is the people listening and the ones that are involved in the chat I'd like to hear if you've got any questions or comments I'd like to hear your way and so uh with that said oh there he comes there you are and here i am do you want me to click on the questions or do you, do you want to i know yeah i can throw them out to you okay Looks like yeah. we had a, i know you did mention the uh the addition of the journal app with the apple platform yes. is yes. there any other apps or tools that you recommend for effectively managing a journal there's, well, I have my phone turned off now. I have another one on there. There's a lot of, you can go in the app store and this, I use, I use iPhones, but you can do the same thing in the Google store. You just, uh, there's a lot of different apps that you can buy that, that the, the one thing, and I'm, I can't think of the name of it, Derek, but there's one journaling app I use. And the reason why I like it is because I can put it on my desktop, my laptop or my phone, and it'll give me prompts. Hey, it's time to write, you know, or something maybe write about. And it, and it syncs them across all platforms. And then uh, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, uh, make an excuse that, well, if, if I sit on my computer, I'd write a journal entry because you can do it on your phone if you wanted to. And then another thing I didn't mention on the journaling part, and, and I know I'm not going to demonstrate it today, but if you, if you heard me, uh, you, well, the reason why I'm not going to demonstrate it today is, uh, I use the notes feature and just talking to the, or, or just, the, I mean, I'm sorry, not the notes, the, uh, the audio recording feature a lot of times, and I'll record my thoughts. I'll just talk to my phone and record them because you can, you can run the audio program back through a third party system. Like uh, Trent is one I can think of. It'll do, it'll do audio to text, but to talk to it, and this, Derek, this is why I'm not going to, going to uh, demonstrate it is, I've got to talk in an accent that doesn't even sound like me because <laughs> Siri, Siri and I have a complicated relationship. She doesn't, in, she doesn't understand my accent most of the time. And so I've got to talk to Siri in an accent she understands. So yeah, you can use any of the journaling apps. Like I said, you can go online and look for just uh, journaling apps and there's a plenty from which to choose, but there's the one built in the iPhone, but even even just built into your phone, like the Notes app or even the audio recording app works good as well. There's no excuse no one should journal now. Yeah, we have everything, everything right yep. there. And like you said, the, the voice, the text now makes everything super easy. Yep. Well, speaking of technology, we had a question on what your thoughts are on nature photographs generated by AI. I, I think that's kind of an oxymoron because... AI is not a natural process. And so I, I don't think much of them because I, I think, I think the thing that, that in the, uh, look, what do I know? But this is just my conjecture. I think the thing that brings appreciation to most people when you're doing nature photography is the act of being out in nature and doing nature photography whether you shoot, and I see it all the time with people I lead on workshops, whether you're taking pictures that you think may be the greatest picture of that subject in the world, or whether you're just capturing pictures that are just going to mean something to you and can go in your scrapbook. And yeah, they may not be the best in the world, but they're good and they're good enough for you. I think just the experience and being out and capturing that is really what is cathartic and, and medicinal for people. So you, you can't, and maybe there's a way you can do it, but I can't see a way that you can top a prompt on a, on a computer and get that same feeling of what you can. If I walked outside, one of the cool things that happens here on Hackberry farm every morning is I walk outside and there's a murder of crows that are spread out across the pasture every day. And it's like, they're, they're that's my morning commute. When I walk outside, it's like, they're waiting on me to show up. I could get online and, 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 and probably create a similar picture, but there's nothing that beats the experience of seeing that and hearing, seeing that with my own eyes hearing it with my own ears and just feeling that, that air on your face when you get out to do stuff like that. So I don't think any amount of AI will ever be able to, uh, to replace that. And so then it becomes so much more about the experience than the, than it does just the rote uh, process of just taking a picture. Totally. Yeah. One, one useful way I've found myself using AI is 
for commercial work. So I have uh, somebody I was I was shooting an album cover for, and we're bouncing ideas back and forth. And it was an easy way for me to take a picture that we had shot in studio from another album cover, superimpose different backgrounds to give him an idea of like, hey, do you like this? Do you like this? Do you like yeah. this? But for me, yeah, I mean, it it served a purpose. But I I agree with you. There's nothing I, I... like getting out there and experiencing the act of taking photos. And, and let me be clear. I think AI is a tool and shouldn't be considered the tool. Does that make sense? Perfect. Yes. Because, because I, you know, like on Photoshop has that generative feel now uh, that, I, I mean, I used it the other day. There was a, there was a, a stick. I had a picture of a bear I was looking at and there's a stick that was kind of distracting. Well, I just circled the stick and did generative feel and it, Fixed it like that. It saved me so much time and effort. Still a picture of the bear. I still got to be there and experience it. It just cleaned that picture up a little bit that made me happier. And so that's why I say it, it uh, to me, and, and and who knows who's right or who's wrong. It's everyone's opinion. But to me, the, I think that's the difference. AI should be considered a tool for photography and not the tool for photography. Totally agree. Yeah. And our final question here, David, used to live in Vernon for about five years. He's asking where in West Texas do you live? Vernon, Texas. That's home. That's home of Roy Orbison. Oh, Pretty woman. That. Yeah, that's where Roy Orbison used to live. Uh, I well, I don't live there anymore, David. I lived for 26 years, about 60 miles east of Vernon, in the town of Childress, is where where we lived in a great little community. In fact, uh, I am uh, I'm working on a project out there right now that will be taking me back out there quite a bit more often. And I was I passed. From to go where I live now to where I used to live in Childress, you go right through Vernon, Texas, and I was through there last week. In fact, awesome. Well, Russ, we always thank you for thinking outside the box. It provides something different from what we normally get in the the educational spectrum, where everything can be so related to bullet points and settings and gear. And and sometimes I think there's such a tie to who we are as people and who we are as creatives. And a lot of what are, what we generate in the arts is just, are we, are we whole as a person? Are we tapping into all of our resources that life offers us? So sometimes it is good to put the gear down and tap into who we are, tap into our surroundings, tap into nature and let the rest figure itself out. I think so. Hey, can we throw in that one slide? I forgot yeah. to go all the way to the end that, yeah, had, def- oh, that, yeah, that, that has my, I said, what's your thing? And, uh, this picture go. here, this is the, uh, there's my contact info. If anybody wants to stay in touch with me and tell me what their thing is. Th- this, uh, this was the trifecta of nighttime shots. This was taken here on my farm, Derek. I just got to tell you this shot and what, what I think is so special about it. Is it the best astrophotography shot? This goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Is it the best star trail shot ever made? No, not by a long shot. But this was one night when we had the moon illuminating the hay bales you know, the moon went down behind the trees to the left of the image. We got dark enough skies to be able to do the star trails. And in between times, see all the little specks of green, the fireflies came out and it made it one magical night. So that's where we all ended that night with. So there we go. If anyone has any questions, I always answer emails. Please feel free to reach out. And uh, I look forward to hearing from everybody. Awesome. Well, Russ, huge thank you to, to you for joining us once again. Thank we'll you, definitely sir. have him back. For those of you out there who always send in the messages, everybody always loves when we have you on, Russ. So thanks. it's great. It's great to know that uh, we're getting across to the viewers. And uh, to all of you out there, thanks for tuning in to another edition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you all next time. Thank you all.